Hello, folks. Today we are talking about igneous rocks. So we're focusing on one of those three limbs of the rock cycle and really honing in on what makes an igneous rock and all of its properties. You can see in the background, we've got an image here of one of these igneous rocks in the process of being formed. Uh, this stuff in here, probably not a rock yet. Why is that? You should be able to tell me based on what a rock is. It's got to be solid, right? So that liquid is still not quite crystallized into mineral grains. But this stuff on the surface here is probably a rock now. And since it's forming from a melt, it is an igneous rock. Based on its color, you can probably guess something about what it's made of. You remember we said igneous rocks are made of silicate minerals. And what color is this? It's dark. We remember that's mafic. So we already know a lot about this, but we're gonna repeat a lot of that information in here to, to help it sink in a little bit. We're gonna learn a few more details about these igneous rocks. And in particular, why we might call this rock basalt. So remember the rock cycle that I just mentioned, that we can break the types of rocks down into igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic that are defined by the process which forms them. We have igneous rocks that we're focusing on today. If we're thinking about how those form, the one in arrow here is cooling of magma or lava at Earth's surface. Remember, it's magma underground, lava at Earth's surface. So first, we've got to melt some other rock, turn it into liquid uh, rock material. It's not a rock because it's liquid. And then we cool it, and we get an igneous rock. And that process of cooling it off and the stuff that makes up the magma is going to define a lot about that igneous rock that we're thinking about. So uh, what are the two major variables for classifying rock within each rock type? We mentioned this a while ago, what the two major categories of variables are that we can use to classify rocks. So we can use it to tell us which igneous rock something is or which sedimentary rock it is or which metamorphic rock it is by these two general properties. Anybody remember? It's going to be texture and composition. These are your two variables. We're going to try to think about all of the different types of rocks that we're looking at. And today it's igneous rocks, but we're going to think about all of them in terms of their texture and composition. Why do we use these? Because they tell us about the process which formed the rock as well. Particular gives us more detail. going to tell us about the cooling process for igneous rocks, and it's going to tell us about the stuff that melted to form it as well. So today we've got a lecture in four parts. We'll start with the major types of igneous rock that you'll want to remember. Then we'll focus on igneous texture, that first variable, and then later we'll focus on composition, the second variable, and the things that control each of those. So these are variables we can see. We'll think about those are observations. We will also think about the interpretations we make based on those observations. Lastly, we'll look at partial melting, magmatic differentiation, and igneous intrusion types, and really expand how we're thinking about igneous rocks. So we've seen this diagram before. To make an igneous rock, we start with another rock, and most critically, we're going to melt it. Often that happens because of burial, because it's hot deep underground. So burial is going to help us do a lot of this melting, but it's not only burial. Uh, there's also going to probably be other heat sources added or things like that. Um, we'll talk about those details. We form magma once we melt a rock. If that magma erupts, that is, it moves to the surface, we call it lava. If we cool magma underground, because it's insulated and it's warm down there, it cools slowly because it's hot underground. So it's not going to cool off very fast. And as it solidifies, it forms what we call an intrusive igneous rock. And notice the speckling on here. We can see the crystals. In the extrusive igneous rocks, which formed on the fast on the surface, where it's cold, 
These are extrusive igneous rocks because the crystals are so small we can't see them. At least not with the naked eye. With the microscope, we could. So uh, just to think about this, let's try to guess based on your experiences with temperatures, how hot do you think lava is? Is it 100 to 200? 700 to 1200? Remember these are in Celsius. 4,000 to 5,000, we're about a million degrees. What do you think? Well, if it were 100 to 200, then any time you put ceramics in the oven, they would, you know, things like uh, stoneware, they would melt. So that can't be it. Can't be that just, you know, because 100 degrees is the boiling temperature of water. It's not that cold. That's way too cold, and you're going to have rocks be solid at that temperature. Um, 7 to 1,200, maybe, seems reasonable. Um, 4,000 to 5,000 degrees, turns out that's the temperature of the core, not the temperature at which uh, rocks melt. That's not right. And about a million degrees, this is the temperature of uh, the surface of the sun and then farther deep interior to the sun too. So it's neither of those. The answer is B. Lava is somewhere between seven to 1200 degrees Celsius when it comes out on Earth's surface. And it's roughly the same temperature as magma interior to Earth as well. What is magma? We tend to think of it as liquid rock material, but in actuality, that's a bit of a simplification because it's kind of more of a slush sometimes. It's sometimes it has solid bits in it already. Some crystals of, of high melting temperature minerals. Trying to write as high T melt minerals. So some minerals have higher melting temperatures or, or crystallization temperatures than others. Clearly, there's going to be a lot of liquid. And since this is silicate, we can call it liquid silicate material. And then there's going to be some gas mixed in. And the gas ends up being important for things like how eruptive the, the eruptions actually are, how dangerous they are. Um, but they're all components, phases within this mixture. So I don't want to give the impression that magma is only liquid. But if we get a little more complicated, we'll see that it's got solids and gases in it as well. How? do minerals crystallize from melt, which is that, that key process and crystallization is what forms new minerals from molten material, right? If you go back to the last lecture, I gave you a little diagram on how in a liquid, the atoms and molecules are able to move around and change their position in space. They're not completely locked in place. by chemical bonds. They're warm enough, and warmth, if we talk about temperature, it's really a measure of the average energy of molecules. So if you give more energy to the atoms and molecules that make up something, those will, they will start to jiggle around and move more. And eventually, they'll start to break some of their bonds and start to move around more freely. That's how you go from a solid to a liquid. So in a liquid, those atoms and molecules can bounce around more, not because they're not locked in place by those chemical bonds. They have enough energy to escape those bonds. Whereas in a solid, like a crystal, like a mineral crystal, atoms and molecules are locked more or less in place by their network of bonds. They're at a lower temperature, which means they have a lower average energy of motion, and liquid becomes solid. I have this video here of what happens when water turns to ice. So we're changing from higher energy to lower of motion during cooling. And this is a molecular simulation of what that would look like at the atom scale. So you'll see the molecules of water start to, they'll bounce around in the liquid phase, but then they'll start to stick to each other in a rigid shape as you form ice. And this is going to be the water down here. And this is going to be the ice in this corner. So we'll take a look at this video. Uh, and you'll get to have a sense of what it means for atoms and elements to crystallize from a liquid and form a solid.
watching that video, you should have been able to see how the water ice surface here slowly expanded over time as the water molecules froze in place on that surface. The same sort of process happens in a silicate melt, except that instead of water molecules made of H2O, we would have something like silicate tetrahedron. It's tetrahedra bouncing around. We might have had you know, other cations in there as well that we've talked about before, all of which would have been bouncing around in the liquid, much like the water molecules we just saw bouncing around, and then they would have stuck to each other to form a regular repeating crystal structure. There are eight types of rocks, major types of igneous rocks that I want you to know in this class, and this is six of, six of them, that we can define well by talking about their composition and their texture. So we have two axes here. We have the compositional axis. And we remember that when we were talking about igneous rock composition, we can talk about what minerals it's made of, whether those minerals are felsic. They have mostly silica and little iron and magnesium. So this is mostly SiO2. Mafic, and they have more Fe and Mg, or whether they're intermediate, mix of both. So the compositional axis of an igneous rock is determined by which silicate minerals it has, whether they're mafic or felsic, or a mix of both. The other axis is texture. When I talk about texture, there are a few vocabulary terms that I'll use. Extrusive and intrusive refers to where the rock formed. Extrusive rocks formed on Earth's exterior, external to Earth. So these used to be lava. They came out of a volcano and they formed on Earth's surface. Intrusive rocks formed inside, interior to Earth. So they form from magma deep underground. Remember what that implies. That means that the extrusive rocks cooled fast, the intrusive rocks cooled slowly. Volcanic and plutonic are other ways to say where this rock formed. So they refer, actually they refer more to the interpretation that we make than the texture. And the texture terms themselves that we're gonna use are affinitic texture, and phanaritic texture, it's an A. You'll see those terms again, but aphanetic means we can't see crystals and phanaritic means we can see the crystals. So we can break these six types of rock down in that way. If we have a felsic aphanitic rock that formed extrusively, we call it a rhyolite. That same composition, if it forms underground and cools underground instead, we get the rock name that we're pretty familiar with at this point called granite. These rocks have the same composition, just different textures because they formed in different places. There are rocks called andesite and diorite, both made of a mix of felsic and mafic minerals. Andesite is the one that erupted onto Earth's surface whereas diorite formed underground. Andesite has an affinitic texture, diorite has a phanaritic texture. Lastly, there are some types of rocks uh, that are mafic. These igneous rocks either formed on Earth's surface, they're called basalt, or they formed deep underground and are called gabbro. This doesn't include the subgroups of volcanic rocks that exit volcanoes extremely quickly so that they're thrown up into the air basically, which are called pyroclastic rocks. And we'll talk about those types. So the other two names that you'll wanna know are obsidian, at least for our purposes, and pumice. You'll see them again, 
But those are your eight rocks that you're going to want to start to know. Rhyolite, andesite, basalt, granite, diorite, gabbro, obsidian, and pumice. And these six that formed either intrusively or extrusively break down well into this table by composition and texture. Here are some images of them. So granite has a lot of light colored minerals in them, sometimes some dark colored minerals in it and varying amounts of that. But usually it's gonna be less than 15% dark stuff. It also tends to have these pink crystals of that pink mineral that we remember. What was that pink silicate? That was orthoclase feldspar. That's a telltale sign of granite. If you see crystals, and some of them are pink and it's igneous, it's a granite, at least as far as we're gonna go. Same sort of pinkish color mixed throughout the rock, but no visible crystals or very few anyway, that's rhyolite. Intermediate, sort of a salt and pepper color where you see light and dark, but you no longer see any of those pink crystals. And you'll probably see a lot more of the dark stuff, maybe 15 to 45%. That's called a diorite. The extrusive version, sort of a medium gray color. And sometimes you do see some crystals in there, but it's just a few. More of it is this sort of medium gray ground mass with no clear crystal boundaries. That's andesite. Basalt is a very dark colored rock. Sometimes it has green little crystals in here of olivine. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it has these bubbles or vesicles that indicate that that magma had a lot of gases that were escaping as it formed. But overall, it is a dark black rock with little visible layering, if any, probably not any. Um, and you can't see the dark crystals in there. That's called basalt. Pretty common one. If it's mostly dark crystals with just a few white ones and you can see the crystal boundaries themselves, that's gabbro. Let's talk about each of these, a little more detail. A little closer up, here's our picture of rhyolite. From a distance, it's gonna look plain, often pinkish. Sometimes you can zoom in and you'll be able to see especially some small black crystals in there, sort of needle shaped. These are probably amphiboles, but you'll only see a few of them. Most of it is the scattered pink color that is a mixture of microscopic orthoclase, which gives it the color, feldspar, some plagioclase, feldspar, some quartz, maybe some biotite, and maybe more Amphibole that's, uh, that's microscopic in size. It forms a few different lava flows on Earth's surface, but rhyolite is fairly uncommon. Here's a picture of one, uh, I believe from Missouri. You can see that pink color really apparently in this image. What's more, you see this weird kind of jointing forming where each of these kind of looks like hexagons or like little columns stuck together. Almost looks like um, you took some paving stones and laid them down there. That's actually, that formed naturally. And this is what's called columnar jointing. And you see that in some extrusive igneous rocks sometimes. If they cooled fast, but not too fast at a regular rate. Granite, okay, so here's a nice picture of granite. Once again, we see the plagioclase, or excuse me, the orthoclase crystals. The black in here is going to be a mix of biotite, mica, and amphiboles. One type that we've talked about is hornblende, which are mafic, but they still have a decent amount of silica in them. Uh, we also have a mixture of plagioclase feldspar in white and quartz that's sort of gray clear. And in granite, you're never going to see nicely formed crystals of quartz because it turns out the quartz sort of forms last and forms in between all the other greens. So it doesn't have as nice of a chance to form these 
relatively regular rectangular shapes like like orthoclase feldspar does in here. That one's pretty rectangular. Not perfect rectangles by any means, right? But you can tell that the boundaries of these are much more regular than whatever is going on here. Now, one really popular and well-known example of granite out in the wild is this place called Half Dome. Climbers love it. I would not love it. I would not love to climb it anyway, um, because I don't have a death wish. Um, but it's made of granite. This is in Yosemite National Park out in California. Now, you notice something. I've mentioned that granite is this intrusive rock. But this half dome structure is clearly sticking out above Earth's surface. So if granite formed underground, how do you think half dome could be a mountain sticking out above Earth's surface? Well, when this formed, there must have been a lot more rock above it that has since eroded away. It's key to remember in geology that the rocks as they exist now are not necessarily and often are not at all in the same situation as the rocks when they formed. All you know is that the granite formed underground from felsic material. That doesn't mean that it's still underground today, because there are lots of changes that occur over Earth history that could exhume or dig up something like this. Andesite. It's a medium gray rock. It sometimes has little crystals of black minerals in it, and sometimes little crystals of white minerals. So those white ones, that's probably plagioclase. This could be one of a number of mafic minerals as these little crystals. I see this sort of squarish cross section there, which makes me think that might be augite. And these needle-like shapes uh, make me think that those are hornblende. But it's probably a mix of things. There might be even biotite in there. A sort of medium gray color because it's intermediate. And the name comes from how much of the Andes Mountains they form. We talked about this when we were talking about plate tectonics. The Andes Mountains are on the edge of the coast of South America. Beautiful art, beautiful. And we've got a convergent plate boundary here where uh, part of the Nazca plate and in some places the Pacific plate is actually subducting underneath the continent here. This mixture of effects where we've got oceanic crust subducting under continental crust, we've got melting going on, we've got all sorts of mixtures of the continental crust and the oceanic crust, ends up making very intermediate composition rocks. Andesite is that intermediate composition rock that appears most often. Diorite is the compositional equivalent of andesite, but this one is intrusive. So it's got a salt pepper appearance. It's got a mixture of mafic and felsic minerals, many of which you can see crystals of. In this one, you can even see a couple of examples of quartz. But a lot of it is plagioclase feldspar. And then biotite, hornblende, uh, augite as mafics. Could have any of those in there. This is an example where we've actually had what we call an intrusion happen, where this bit of intermediate magma intruded into what was likely an otherwise mafic rock. And slowly it cooled and crystallized and formed a diorite intrusion. Basalt. So basalt, it's extrusive, right? Forms exterior because we don't see very many crystals in our pieces of basalt. It's a pretty plain black rock often. So it can be really plain like this and have basically no distinguishing features. Or this is about as interesting as basalt gets because we see some crystals of olivine. We see some vesicles, some bubbles. One place that we get a lot of basalt forming uh, is in Hawaii. 
So this is an image of a bus that has been overtaken by a basalt lava flow and buried and burned uh, by that basalt flow. Now, I doubt there were people in this bus at the time because these basalt flows are moving pretty slowly. They're moving at two miles an hour, give or take. So it probably, uh, you probably had enough time for people to escape this bus here. Um, but you do see these big basalt lava flows. Um, and this basalt is mafic and often forms at hot spots or as a result of divergent plate boundaries. Gabbro is the stuff, same as the basalt, so it's mafic, but it forms interior to Earth, so it's intrusive. Has a much darker appearance. Sometimes you can see just a little bit of greenish color to it, but not always, like at this one up here. And for the most part, we really don't find very much gabbro at our surface. It's pretty dense and it formed underground, so it tends to not push up very much. But sometimes at the edges of collisional events on continents, you can find some gabbro that gets pushed up. Or in this case, this is an Iceland, where some rocks that used to be underground as they formed at this divergent plate boundary in the ocean. Some of this gabbro here got exhumed, unburied, much like half dome. And if you go up there, you will see that it looks like these rocks here. Clearly, the sediments that are wasting off of this area are mafic. And you can tell that just by looking at the sediments that have rolled down that slope. Over time, though, these will weather. Remember that mafic minerals weather very easily. OK, so we've looked at these in some detail now. And it is up to you to memorize them. You're going to have to come up with a way to remember each of the six major igneous rock types, these six. And then you'll have to remember the other two that I talked about that were the pyroclastics too. But in person, I would have my class sit here and brainstorm some things. Um, various students have had success with very simple ones like, oh, basalt, that B, it's the black rock. Gabbro, two Bs, it's the other black rock, but for some reason, it helped them remember that there were crystals in this one. I've had a student that said diorite reminds me of Doritos. Doritos are speckled. And I like to put them into my stomach. So he was able to remember that diorite was the intermediate speckled or intrusive rock. Come up with any way that you want to remember this. Granite, it's made of grains, so that can at least help you remember that it's intrusive, but it's up to you to remember that it's the felsic one. Rhyolite is light in color, so it's got to be felsic. How you remember it's extrusive is up to you. It's your responsibility to, to memorize these, so this is going to be your study skills at work. Let's think about these rocks some more and try to interpret something about them. Which of the following lists the rocks in order of increasing silica content. This might be the sort of question you'd see in a test. I do like to have tests with multiple choice answers. I think that's pretty common. We're looking for increasing silica content. So we're probably looking for something that goes from mafic to felsic, because increasing silica content, if we want to interpret that, we say more silica means felsic, less silica means mafic. And so this is probably intermediate in between. So which of these lists a mafic rock, then an intermediate rock, and then a felsic rock? Pro process of elimination. You want to remember basalt B black rock. That's got to be the mafic one. Rhyolite, that was light in color. That's felsic. Andesite, well, if you go back and look, that was the intermediate one. So it can't be A or B. Now, which is it? Is andesite the intermediate and rhyolite the felsic? or is rhyolite the intermediate and andesite this felsic? This one was right. So that's your answer there. Now, as a reminder, all igneous rocks are made of crystals, even if you can't see them. Well, I will say that these six rocks at least are made of, of crystals that form from a melt, even if you can't see the crystals with your naked eye. Granite, diorite, andesite, rhyolite, gabbro basalt, they're all made of crystals of minerals. Granted, it's easy to see those crystals. Basalt, it's not so easy. But if you zoom in, you'll see those microscopic crystals still. Let 
as we see, we've zoomed in about 10 times here to see those crystals. If you're lucky, you can see a couple of them with your naked eye. You can even make out just a few there. But you can't tell anything about their shape until you zoom in and take a good look. 